of all things that are to be known, this is most evident that God is to be feared, to be reverenced, served, and worshipped. This is so the beginning of knowledge. This is so the beginning of knowledge that those know nothing who do not know him. So wrote English Puritan commentator Matthew Henry more than 300 years ago. But in Romans chapter 3 and verse 18, we find the Apostle Paul's great indictment against sinful mankind. He argues as a prosecuting attorney on behalf of the offended party he represents, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, the Holy One of Israel. And what is the culmination of Paul's charges against sinful man? There is no fear of God before their eyes. An articulate and well-informed person with some level of sophistication would readily grant that God is not feared anywhere in the world in the year 2022, except for the odd person here and there. He is not feared in Africa, where genocide is the rule and not the exception, and where AIDS once and now monkeypox infects so many as the result of an astounding level of sexual promiscuity. Our missionary to Africa reported some years ago that they did a study of truck drivers in sub-Sahara Africa. The average truck driver in sub-Sahara Africa has 30 sexual encounters per month with women not married to him. That's average. Wow. And I thought truck stop activity was bad. God is not feared throughout Asia, where his name is not known in idol-worshipping India or atheistic China or Buddhist Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, or Laos. God is not feared in Europe, where there are more practicing Muslims than there are church-going professing Christians. And certainly in South America, where it is commonly accepted that married men will commit adultery with a mistress. And in North America, where same-sex marriage is legal, where pornography is spreading like prairie fire, where 30 million unborn children have been burned to death with chemicals or sucked into sinks since 1973 and where the fear of God is unknown among the great masses of professing Christians, it can be rightly observed that there is no fear of God before their eyes. But how then is one to reconcile this obvious present day fact with Matthew Henry's assertion that if a person doesn't fear God, he doesn't really know anything. It is clear that mankind, including modern-day Pentecostals, modern-day Charismatics, modern-day New Evangelicals, and the vast majority of Baptists simply do not fear God and hence do not know anything of importance, do not know anything of value, do not know anything of significance in eternity. Before you protest in your mind and heart at what I say, consider my words. Where do you observe God-fearing people, people who fear God? Where? Where have you seen them? I have been back and forth across the country. In years past, I have traveled to a number of foreign countries. As well, I know and regularly communicate with people on every continent except Antarctica. And I receive no reports of people fearing God from any of those I correspond with. As well, I read. I know. But I read books. 
I subscribe to the Epoch Times and several magazines. I'm an active news gatherer on social media and the internet. I also listen to two news radio stations almost every day. Yet I have never seen or heard reported anything, anything resembling a manifestation of the fear of God by anyone. Several years ago, an outbreak in Toronto, Canada, began what was called the Laughing Revival. It took root and its after effects continues in various Pentecostal and charismatic groups and has continued for years. But it was so unorthodox, even for the denominations of the congregations that originally embraced it, that the denomination of the original Toronto Laughing Revival congregation expelled them. Still, the phenomenon spread, but was the Laughing Revival really a revival? And was God's presence really manifested in those places where the Laughing Revival is said to have occurred, where folks laughed hysterically in the services and you're not going to believe this, but I promise it's true, frequently barked like dogs. I can tell you this, there was no fear of God in those places by the testimonies of those participating. After that came a fad where God supposedly changed people's fillings into gold. Really. Never mind that the gold-looking stuff turned out to be plastic. Never mind that there was, has never been a dentist verify a single of those claims or attest that he or she didn't put the gold crown on. Folks, even if the teeth did turn out to be gold, which they have not been, the important fact, the truly important fact, is that there was no fear of God exhibited. Then along came Hillsong from Australia, spreading worldwide, featuring astonishingly inappropriate music and an acceptance of conduct that is expressly condemned in God's word. But their approach is being emulated because they are very, very entertaining. The problem? The, the serious problem? You mean besides the complete absence of the gospel message? There is no fear of God. The absence of fear of God by reflecting on their own testimonies is indisputable. Whether a Mormon or a Baptist or a Catholic or a Pentecostal or an atheist observed these various meetings, they would all agree that those people do not exhibit a fear of God. Though such people agree on little else, they would all agree to that. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Let me tell you something. If you do not fear God, there's something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with God. There's something wrong with you if you do not fear God. Yet we are commanded to fear God. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13 reads, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 17 reads, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Revelation chapter 14 verse 7 reads, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Can it be denied then that all people everywhere are commanded to feel God, I, uh, to fear God? I, I could have cited many more passages, but the one from the Old Testament, the one dealing with church age Christians, and the final one expressing the will of God during the coming, coming tribulation provides clear proof of God's will for us all down through the ages. But that's not all. We're also commanded to serve God with fear. 
and given a motive for doing so. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29, serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. That's an imperative verb. That's not an optional thing. And for our God is a consuming fire. That, that's why you do that. Serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. So we see two things in that passage. First, reverence and godly fear are not the same thing. So the argument advanced by some that fear means only to reverence God, that argument is destroyed. Second, the idea that a Christian would or would not serve God depending on whim or fancy, hurt feelings, or imagined offense is refuted. Well, I'm not going to serve God because somebody said something nasty to me at church one day. That doesn't wash. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to serve God because uh, somebody furrowed their brow at me one time and they didn't shake hands at me when they walked past me. That doesn't wash. Christians have some awareness that God is a consuming fire. Therefore, they do serve him acceptably. So, question, how do you serve God, Christian? I'm asking for a friend. Do you serve God? Oh, you have your own ministry and, and serve God in your own way? Oh, I see. But is such service truly acceptable service? Acceptable to whom? Huh? Study 1 Corinthians chapter 3 sometime. If your service is not service and ministry in your church, it is not acceptable service to God. He decides what's acceptable, not you, not me. One more truth to ponder. Fear is rightly understood to be a title of God. Oh, yes. This is a startling realization to many who are, who are unfamiliar with God's word. Yet it is true, oh, how it exposes those people who have an unscriptural view of God. We're not talking about the God of your imagination or the God of your preferences, but the God who has revealed himself in his word. Listen to the words of the patriarch Jacob speaking to his uncle Laban shortly before his return to the promised land with his family and his flocks. I read a portion of Jacob's statement from Genesis chapter 31, verse 42. Go back and read it yourself for context later. Jacob said, Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me. Later, when Jacob was establishing a covenant with his uncle Laban, Moses records the incident in Genesis chapter 31, verse 53, with these words, Moses wrote, and Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. But he was obviously swearing by God. The fear of his father Isaac is God. Notice that Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, the friend of God, the son of Isaac, and the third consecutive descendant of Terah, to whom God's presence had been manifested, titled God. He titled God as the fear of Isaac. As well, Moses, when writing Genesis, also titled God as the fear of Isaac. My friend, that's what they say is profound. I'm talking to you guys now. If your name was, say, Bill, <clears throat> would your son think of God? Now think about this. If your name was Bill, would your son think of God as the fear of Bill? If your name, if you're a woman and your name was Mary, would your daughter, in her mind, Think of God as the fear of Mary. Is God your God your fear? 
And is he obviously so to your children? That is to say, would your son acknowledge God is the fear of my father? A daughter would say, yes, God is the fear of my mother. There are things that mom will not do because God is her fear. There are things that she will do and will never stop doing, no matter what anybody else says or does, because God is her fear. That's a question that you need answered, moms. That's a question you need answered, dads. John Bunyan, the author of the famous Pilgrim's Progress, a book more widely read in the English-speaking world than anything except the Bible over the last 400 years, wrote that the fear of God is man's highest duty, for there is no other duty which can be performed by man in a manner acceptable to God which is not seasoned with godly fear. Why is it then? Why is it then? That though Isaac feared God, that though Jacob feared God, that though Moses feared God, why is it then that you do not fear God? Methinks that if you feared God, your church attendance pattern would probably be different than it is. Don't you think? Your Bible reading pattern would probably be different than it is, don't you think? Your prayer would likely be different than it presently is, don't you think? <clears throat> and why is it that until modern times with such men as Matthew Henry, who I quoted at the outset, and with such men as John Bunyan, and with such men as Jonathan Edwards, and with such men as George Whitfield, and with such men as Asahel Nettleton, the fear of God was a clearly understood to them duty. Yet professing Christians these days do not see the fear of God as a necessary duty. Why is that, you think? Why, why is that, you think? Uh, I would suggest... It's a free country because everybody can do what they want, and they obviously do. I would suggest that you consider this. When Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Joshua and Gideon and David and Elijah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and all those found in the Bible feared God, their fear, their fear bore some relationship to the presence of God in their midst. Somehow and in some way, God, who is everywhere present, we would never deny that. He is omnipresent. He made men keenly aware of his unusual presence in a remarkable and unforgettable way. As well, in days gone by, the Puritans were a people who were so keenly aware of God's majesty and might, so conscious of his purity and holiness, so devout in their personal devotions, and so blessed in their experiences with revival, that somehow and in some way, either in their prayer closets or in the midst of these revivals, God's unusual presence was made so real to them that they came to greatly fear him. Why then do you not fear God? Why then do the laughing revival Pentecostals not fear God? Why do the Hillsong people and their fellow travelers not fear God? Why do the new evangelicals and charismatics exhibit no fear of God in any of their doings, in any of their testifyings, in any of their songs or sermons? They never sing about the fear of God. They never preach about the fear of God. They never pay attention to the fear of God. And why, I am deeply troubled to ask, have I never one time, me personally, 
heard a preacher that I can remember among the ranks of the Baptists. In my 47 years of ministry and meetings, why have I never heard anyone preach a sermon about or make allusion to in a memorable way the fear of God? It deeply troubles me to suggest that the absence of the fear of God, the absence of any reference to or manifestation of the fear of God is the result, listen carefully, I think it is the result of having no experience with the presence of God. I'm not suggesting that you seek experiences I'm not suggesting that. I'm not a mystic and have never advocated anyone seeking mystical experiences or manifestations of the presence of God. But I am suggesting this. Though a special and profound awareness of the presence of God is not something you should seek. It is something that God may grant you sovereignly. And though you should never seek feelings and you should never seek experiences, you should seek him. You should pursue God, perhaps in the pursuit of God or perhaps in the suit of Christ, by you who are lost. God will graciously make you aware of his majestic presence. If that happens, you will fear him. Why so? Because the Bible teaches God's presence is fearful. I understand that you need to understand that you are duty bound to fear God, his presence manifested or not. Whether he has made his presence known to you or not, you're duty bound to fear him. But if his presence is manifested, you will experience what I am about to show you in the word of God. Until then, it must be taken by faith. The fear of God must be sought through a study of scriptures and through your pleadings with God. To help you, I show you this morning that God's presence is seen to be fearful in three ways. First, to see God for who he is is to fear him. Revelation chapter 1 verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. This is the reaction of John the Beloved when he set his eyes upon the glorified Son of God. And what can possibly be the explanation for this reaction by the apostle whom Jesus loved the apostle who lay his head on the Savior's breast in the upper room, the, the explanation is straightforward. He saw God, specifically the Son of God, for who he is. The result, he fell at his feet as dead. Why this reaction from John the Revelator and not from these modern-day charlatans who claim to have visions of Jesus Christ? We, we know who appeared to John. We, we do not know who these modern-day charlatans actually saw, do we? They say who they saw, but we don't know that. If they saw Jesus, why are they so proud that they refused to fall down before him? Or, or could it be that these fellows who say they saw Jesus are only making up stories? They, they couldn't be religious charlatans now, could they? That's not possible, is it? You say, but pastor, Jesus said to John, fear not. Yes, but he was instructing John to replace his slavish fear, his natural and instinctive terror, with a filial fear, with an instructed and love-based fear. There's a wrong kind of fear and a right kind of fear. And if Christ's instruction is not understood to be as I have described it, why are we instructed in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, to serve God with godly fear? No, the Bible is clear when it is taken as a whole. To see God for who he is is to fear him. And this is good. 
Man, when he sees God for who he really is, finds God incomprehensible, finds God overwhelming, finds God awe-inspiring, finds God terrible in majesty, and finds God altogether unbearable. Job chapter 13, verses 21 and 22, Withdraw thine hand far from me, and let not thy dread make me afraid. Then call thou, and I will answer, or let me speak, and answer thou me. What does this mean that Job is saying? How are we to understand his words spoken to God? Is he being irreverent here? Just a few verses earlier, Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So here speaks a man who is spiritual. Here speaks a man who is humbled before his God. And what he is indicating is his inability to deal with the manifest presence of God. I'm not able to do this. He anticipates what John actually experienced and is pleading with God to spare him the experience of his dreadful majesty. He is crying in so many words, Lord, please do not overwhelm me with your presence. I can't take it. Just speak to me and I will answer you or let me speak to you and you can answer me. Job knew, as few other men have ever known, that to see God for who he is, is to fear him. Some pious fraud will criticize me, no doubt, for understanding Job in this way. But I well remember the testimony of a Scottish woman from the Isle of Lewis revival around the year 1950. I have a record of her testimony an mp3 file of her testimony and she said and I, I'm not going to even try to imitate her Scottish accent but she said you want to meet God it's a wonderful thing to meet with God but it's a terrible thing to meet with God and she spoke from deep experience and did not Paul write knowing therefore the terror of the Lord Truly, to see God for who he is, is to fear him. As well, to see yourself for what you are makes you fear him. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 and 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Verse 5. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah was a prophet of God. He was a man called to represent God to the people of the kingdom of Judah. As well, he was a man set aside by God for the purpose of writing a profoundly important portion of the prophetical portion of the Hebrew scriptures. But notice his reaction regarding himself when he finds himself in the presence of God. Because his eyes had seen the king, the Lord of hosts, this godly and consecrated servant of God estimated himself to be one who is undone. And as a man of unclean lips, his reaction to that is, Woe is me! Surely... This can be seen to be a reaction provoked by fear. A holy fear, an awesome fear arising from the presence of God. Catching a glimpse of God's majesty and might, of his greatness and his glory, of his purity and his power, revealed to Isaiah a great deal about himself. Did it not? No wonder Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 18 verse 2, A fool hath no delight... In understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. It's a fool who seeks to learn about himself by learning, by looking inward, where there is only a wicked and deceitful heart. What did Isaiah learn of himself when he saw God's glory and when he thereby saw himself as he really is, how he did fear God? Daniel chapter 10, verses 8 and 11. Therefore I was left alone, the prophet writes, and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, 
for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Verse 11, And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Consider this for a moment. Daniel has just been paid a high compliment by the angel. He is a man greatly beloved. But his comeliness was turned in him to corruption. That's how he perceived himself. That was his self-image when his self-image was a clear and accurate perception of reality. And he stood trembling. Well, you know, my problem is I just don't have a good self-image. No, your problem is you have a good self-image. That's your problem. That's your problem. If the presence of God is not a fearful and dreadful thing in his most gracious appearances, in his most merciful dealings with his choicest servants, imagine what must happen when God's presence is made known to one who does not like God's ways, to one who does not know Jesus Christ. So when God's presence is perceived, it creates in a person the profoundest awareness of unworthiness, of uncleanness, of weakness, of impotency, of smallness, of personal defilement. No wonder someone is a fool who looks inwardly to understand himself in an attempt to discover what he's really like. That's just dumb. You don't get an idea of what you're really like by looking inwardly because your capacity for self-deception is too great and your estimation of yourself is too high. But when you catch a glimpse of God and His glory, ha, you can't fool yourself. How does your personal glory compare to the sunlight of His glory? How does your posturing and strutting compare to his awful majesty and his regal splendor? No wonder Solomon connects the fear of God with the knowledge of the holy in Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. When you have some knowledge of the holy, knowledge of God's holiness, then you really do understand some things. And knowing yourself from a consideration of God's august majesty, you will fear him. The person who does not fear God, therefore, is the individual who really knows nothing of himself and who has no experience with the presence of God. Finally, to see God's goodness makes you fear him. We will quickly look at three passages to support this truth, which so contradicts the imagination of the heathen, whether they be professing Christians or not, they're still heathens, who think that God's goodness casts out fear of him. Does God's goodness shown to someone then remove the fear of God? Well, l l let's see. Hosea chapter 3 verse 5 reads, Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. This is a prophetic passage of scripture describing life for Israel during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ after his second coming. And what will we find in the millennium? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. During that time of the fullness of God's Holy Spirit, such as has never before been on earth, we will find that God's people will fear him and his goodness. So much for God's goodness putting away a man's fear of him. Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 22, 23, and 24. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will you not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass it? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, 
Yet can they not prevail, though they roar. Yet can they not pass over it. But this people hath a revolting and rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither say they in their heart, Let us know the fear of the Lord our God that giveth rain, both the former and the latter. In his season he reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Is it not the goodness of God that provides the early and the latter rain to grow crops? Is it not the goodness of God that reserves to his people weeks of harvest for the gathering of grain? Yet in verse 24 we see, Let us now fear the Lord our God for being good in this way. And it is only those who have a revolting and a rebellious heart who do not fear God, according to verse 22 and 23. If you were to go to Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 8 and 9, wherein is described the new covenant, you would see that those whose sins are forgiven, those whose transgressions are pardoned, shall fear and tremble for all God's goodness toward them, so much for God's goodness putting away a man's fear of him. One final passage, Job 42, verses 5 and 6. Job says, I have heard thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. How good and gracious and merciful was God to manifest his presence to Job. How little Job had understood of the sufferings he experienced at the instigation of Satan. And now when God has chosen to show this man the goodness of his heart, what did he say? How did he behave himself in God's presence? How he obviously feared God when he experienced the goodness of God. I say yet again, so much for God's goodness putting away a man's fear of him. It's so much bunk. You are commanded to fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. God himself describes someone as having a revolting and rebellious heart who does not fear and tremble in his presence. Yet, you still do not fear God. Do you have any idea what it means for you to have no fear of God? Can you imagine what the implications are of having no fear of God? Fear of God, folks, is a foundational grace. It is that grace upon which knowledge, upon which understanding, and upon which wisdom are built. What's to be done with a person who does not fear God? who does not seek to fear God, who does not seek the God who is to be feared after preaching the truth to him. I, I, honestly, I don't know. I don't know. If after the preaching you do not fear God, you do not seek to fear God, you do not seek the God who is to be feared, then you are beyond any help that I can render you except for prayer. There's always prayer. What you need, my friend, is for God to reach down and grab hold of you. You need the Holy Spirit's conviction, conviction ministry to bear witness to the truth of these things I have told you. And you need to come to Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the word of God. So very, very clear to those with the eyes to see. So easy to understand for those who have the ears to hear. I pray that you might speak to hearts so that people would realize there's nothing wrong with you. You are perfect in all your attributes. You cannot change because you are perfection. Therefore, one who does not fear you is the one who is wrong, the one who is damaged, the one who is twisted, who is warped, and who needs your gracious hand upon his life 
upon her life. Help us to recognize, Father, that those of us who do not fear you are the ones who are in the wrong because you are God. Therefore, we commit this message to you. Pray that you might bless in a wonderful, gracious, and merciful way that you might give me opportunity to have ministry in people's lives even after the message has been finally delivered. And for this, I thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.